With God, there is always more. More love, more life, more freedom. Welcome to Zoe's Exploring More with Michael Thompson. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful ends for us along our journey, but He takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home. Join me and the team as we explore the kingdom together, discovering the deep truths and offering encouragement for the journey. There is always more. Welcome, friends and allies, to the Exploring More podcast. We are in the middle of a series on the masculine journey. I'm with my friends, SJ and Tom, and we're going to continue this exploration about more of these stages of the masculine journey. Particularly, we're going to talk about the king stage. Uh, Loved our time with Gary, talking about the sage. We did the overview of the masculine journey, and we talked about this stage of a man's life where he comes into a time, a decade, maybe even more, maybe 20-some years of reigning and ruling. There's something that God has entrusted to him, something he's presiding over, and we call that the king stage. Yeah, I'm glad to have you guys with us. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Glad to be here. And really, it's appropriate to some degree, because this is a council of kings. I mean, we've lived through all these stages. I felt a little disqualified for the sage stage, but we had Gary. Yeah, Gary and Jim Shanae, they were great. Well, they're old. They're old. (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> We've got a we got a saying here at Zoe. If we're not sure who said something, it was probably Gary Barklow. Yeah. Because he's just pretty awesome that way. He's the Vince Lombardi. <laughs> but they are old. You're right. <laughs> so they, they're in that the point was they're in that stage. They and are. Uh, so before we talk about the king stage, would you talk about your kingdom where God's placed you now? What are you responsible for? And I think this is part of what a good king realizes and knows that he's been entrusted with something. People, sometimes it's treasure, sometimes it's a talent, sometimes it's a company, sometimes it's it's personnel. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it can be property. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can come into this younger. You can come into this younger, but it may not be appropriate. You may not be in that stage where wisdom has been earned. And we're going to get into that, but just describe a little bit about your kingdom. I think that'd be helpful. And then SJ, if you'll take a shot at that, what your kingdom looks like, and then we'll talk about what being kings is all about. Okay. Well, I guess I would direct it into the work realm, business realm, because that's probably where my biggest influence or at least responsibility lies. That started out in 1980 with me and a helper and a mud pan and a hoe to mix mortar and just I had authority over one guy and and me. And as time grew and as I got older and as I trained people and learned how to teach certain skills to them and apprentice them, the responsibilities got bigger and more things to think about. And then all of a sudden you're talking about insurance and employee benefits and Mm -hmm. the bigger picture of what a company evolves into. And then I have sons who or in business with me that are part of that kingdom. And it's always a challenge to handle that properly. And I would love listening to the podcast with Gary talking about just the way you are as you get older, you learn to be less dictatorial and less it's got to be my way or the highway. So that's kind of the tension. But um, for me, it's really learning how to do that well and how to exit that well, because I'm in the process of letting go of a lot of it and trying to trust other people to do things that I used to do. And so that's kind of the scope of what I would consider my kingdom, I guess, my properties and finances, all of that. Right. And know, it's grown. Which grows as you get older. It's, it's amazing what happens. You I know, think that's part, of the quali- that's part of the quality that we yeah. would want. Things don't have to go perfectly well. I'm not saying that. But there's something that grows under a king's watch, under a king's attention. And that going from you and a guy in a wheelbarrow of mortar you mm-hmm. know, to several a dozen mm-hmm. employees and several subcontractors and watching the zeros be added to the contracts. You're not just kind of doing yeah. weekly pay- payroll pay- gets bigger and bigger. Yes, and- all those things so that it can go well and learning how to do those things well and preside over them, make decisions, use the mistakes of your past for the wisdom that's being offered in that. I mean, that's what Kings do. Right. It's not all going well all the time. We've had lots of attempts at things. We've rebooted, we've recalibrated, but we've stayed at that in those seasons. We'll call them winter when things aren't growing so well. Yeah. You don't know. I'm not talking about the calendar of the year. I'm talking about seasons of a man's life. Mm-hmm. You'll go through many winters. 
when certain parts of your life maybe aren't growing, they aren't going well. Maybe there's some dormancy. So, but that's a good description of part of what you find yourself presiding over, what mm-hmm. God's given you and trusted to you to love and lead others, to exercise your will in a way that actually it goes that way a lot of the times. What you have decided, what direction mm-hmm. you want to go, when you put that out there in front of your employees, your sons. It's almost like we get charged with the responsibility of influencing and determining the culture of your yeah. little kingdom, however big or small it is, because I've heard it said before, you know, the spirit of any organization is really a reflection of the leader, of the founder, of the person the who king. originated. Yeah. And so that really points to a large role yeah. in any organization as to what's the flavor going to be like, how are people going to treat one another when they come into that organization? Are they going to absorb into that culture or is it going to spit them out because they don't fit? And we see that a lot in different groups and different people that we work with. But I've always believed strongly that I want to select and nurture certain qualities and attitudes in our company that I know have served us well over the years. And so I kind of fight for that a little bit. Can I ask you to stretch a little bit beyond your company? Because I think your kingdom is bigger than that. I want us to make that connection. Okay. You have a family, you have a home. There's a place where your will is often exercised in collaboration with your beautiful wife, Pat. Mm -hmm. You host us there often in your uh, castle. And if you'll continue to talk about your influence, your responsibility within Zoe, that's part of your kingdom. That's part of what's been entrusted to you and part of something you do really well. You bring it there too, what you bring to other places. It's not confined, is my point, to a company. I guess I would respond to that by saying that I feel very compelled, especially not only in the day-to-day with us together when we get together and um, compelled to share what I've been learning or what I'm curious about or what I'm even confused about, you know, because that's what a collaboration of friends is all about. But within the larger scope in terms of the conferencing and the roles I've had there, I've always felt, and this always happens when we get on the grounds of these conference sites, it's almost like God gives me a supernatural ability to just be present with whoever I'm with. Mm-hmm. It's like this little cocoon, and I'm sure it's about the prayers that have been offered for mm-hmm. months quite often yeah. before Leading the event, mm-hmm. during. It's the most easy environment for me to completely be present with people, love the men that come, listen to their stories. And that's not just a duty. It's just how it feels. It just is what I want to do. It's how I'm compelled and and it's what I love to do. So encouraging men. I think another word for a king is a good father. I mean, fathering is a component of a king in that regard. You know, people that are looking for guidance, looking for encouragement, looking for vision, we can share with them the things that we've learned that are helpful and hopefully help them avoid things that could be booby traps or, you know, stuff that we don't want to step into. Yeah. So that's a great place for, I think, for me to ask you this question, Tom, or just if you would share a little bit of the story of your marriage to Pat. You were a father of children immediately when you guys got married because Pat had been married before, right? I mean, so that's like, okay, I'm, I'm growing up, I'm developing my business, and now, boom, I've got a family instantly. Mm -hmm. What was that like? It was very motivating. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, if you ever want to light a fire under a young man, that would do it. For for provision. uh, Yeah. yeah. I, I just felt so, so much of a responsibility maybe to a fault to a degree in terms of trying to work and provide and be hyper-focused on that. But when I married Pat in 1980, she had four children. One was a toddler, a two-year-old, and two 12-year-olds. And since had two together, which has been a wonderful thing that was actually a surprise. But I do remember having to take authority over certain things, especially with the 12-year-olds who weren't used to boundaries, weren't used to being told you cannot do that. One of the two twin boys, the older ones, was much stronger and dominant and would beat up on his brother a lot. And I'll never forget, there was this moment where I had to intervene and I just told him, I said, Josh, this isn't going to work. You cannot do this. Mm -hmm. I cannot tolerate this in our home. I'm sorry, but it's just not acceptable. And actually created a bit of a rift in our relationship for a season. But I think he knew 
my heart was good about that and that it was the right thing, but he just wasn't used to it. So he, he kind of fought a little yeah. bit. But then just the sense of needing to pay the bills and figure it all out, that can be scary, really yeah. scary. I really like the connection. I'm not sure it's synonymous, but I think you're right. I believe that there's a connection between fathering and being a good king. And yet I look back on my story, this is a stage, I think, for another time where as a young father, I'm not sure I was a king. I think I was in another stage mm -hmm. of learning and yeah. development, but that stage is necessary for the next stage, you know, growing mm -hmm. in kingdom. Yes, I was in a role as a father and a husband, but I was still learning a lot about how things worked, mm -hmm. right? Ranger stage and learning how to fight for what's right and good and true. So there was a lot of Warrior. lessons at that stage in yeah. my thirties. <laughs> so I think this king stage is something that is more indicative of 40, 50, and 60-year-olds when they're coming in. I mean, you think about your dad or our dads and their reign over us. There's something in my 30s, I still felt very young with my dad, and we're not equals, and I don't see it that way, but I see myself more grown up and more of a man-to-man -man relationship. So it's just some interesting observation, but I, I want to tell one story about what you were talking about with at the weekends. I believe you, I've seen you it's a part of what you offer, mm -hmm. what God has entrusted to you then to give to others, which I think a good king knows, and how present you are with men. And so this last Heart of a Warrior Advance, I'm sitting in the meeting room, big room, 100 guys at the advance. And so this gentleman comes up to me and is talking to me and he said, you know, I really want to meet Tom Binner. I would really like to visit with him. And I said, well, sure. I said, do you know who Tom is? He said, no, no, I'm not sure which one he is. And you were going to speak at mm -hmm. the next session. It was so funny. So I said to this older, he was probably in his 60s. And I said, well, there he is right there. And I pointed to Tom and he goes, you're kidding. I just had lunch with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> he didn't even know that was Tom. Right. But that's to your point. That's mm. how he, yeah. he experienced you. You were present. And I love that he didn't know who you were. And then you, a minute or two after yeah, that, you funny. went up to the stage and you shared about something that God was showing you. And so you're talking about your influence. I love that you use the word responsible. Your responsibilities have grown in this stage to a pretty important amount. We'll get into some more of that in a minute. How about your kingdom? Back to that first question. What's your kingdom like, SJ? What is it you feel like God is putting you in charge, responsible, the care, and to love those in that space. Yeah. What's amazing about that is I was listening to Tom share about, you know, what he's reigning over. I didn't start a business 25 years ago or like Tom did, and our lives are not identical by any stretch. But in the concept of being a king and learning to reign over and take responsibility for what has been placed in your lap, it's the same. And I think that's part of what I hope we can communicate to our listeners in this and the rest of the episodes about the masculine journey is that some of these guys might be thinking, man, I just lost my business. You know, I'm not a good king or I just got divorced or I'm estranged from one of my kids, you know? So they're going through a difficult time in the context of their kingdom. Whoever is hearing that right now, they're not alone. We've all been through these difficult times. We've all had successes in our kingdoms. We've all had failures in our kingdoms, mm -hmm. things we look back on and we wish we had done differently or handled differently. And so I think part of what being a good king, and I'll answer your question in a minute, Michael, but I think part of being a good king is recognizing, okay, you got enough miles behind you to recognize that everything's not going to go the way you want it to go. And there's a way That's to so handle true. that when it comes up, when it happens. And when I was, like you were talking about in that warrior stage, the ranger stage, a young father, my son actually just had his 24th birthday yesterday. So I was 24. He's exactly half my age now. I was 24 years old when he was born. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I was definitely not a king. I think I, maybe I thought I was, but I didn't know what I was doing. What's crazy so, is so many of those books I read. Yeah. My kids weren't doing it the way that <laughs> yeah. those chapters, non those, those chapters kids, were ending. You know, my I'm kids like, are non -compliant. Kids, read this chapter that I just right. read on fathering. Yeah. This is how. There should be a book on childrening, right? right, right. <laughs> how to be a good child. No, but 
My kingdom consists of my home, my wife, my son. We just actually helped him move up to Philadelphia, so launched the prince out of the castle. That's a great part of a king's responsibility, you know, yeah. with his children especially, setting yeah. them up, putting it's... them into their warrior and warrior princess stages, right? I think the hardest thing for me about that was getting over the fact that it wasn't going to look exactly like it did for me. You know, I'm that guy, as soon as I could leave home, I left, you know, and I turned 18 and I was out the door and that kind of deal. For a long time, I lived with that expectation that that's what my son was going to do too, that he was just going to take life by the horns or some other BS and just get out. And it took him a little bit longer to get his legs up under him. And that's fine. I would much rather him be under my roof in my castle, figuring out how to get his legs under him than being out in the world, to be honest with you. So he's done a great job now. He's transitioned really well. So yeah, my wife, Sherry, my son, and our little kingdom up there northwest of Durham, and much of what I hold responsibility for is providing resources and many other things here at Zoe. And as I made the transition in 2016 from being on staff full-time at a church to being in the mission field on this team with Zoe, I have learned a ton. And I think in that transition period, I've been able to take on more and more of a kingly role in the organization, helping you to steer where we're going as an organization. That's Mm -hmm. a huge responsibility. Yeah. A lot of the resources that are available online and a lot of the audio and video things, you know, you've had a hand in. And I think this part of the journey is a king's influence is on display and it can be good. It can be wonderful, Mm -hmm. but it also can be really damaging. Because there's more collateral damage when a king doesn't love well. And, because and, the stakes are higher, yeah, right? And I, yeah, and I like what both of you said, that just because it isn't going well with a son or a daughter or an employee or a friend doesn't mm-hmm. mean that it's not going in a direction that it should. We wouldn't want to communicate that, that right. you're not a good king if it's not all good. Mm-hmm. No, Because it, it can be really, really hard. We've all learned that. Because even you said amen to that, it's as kings you've experienced that. You know that that's mm-hmm. true. And I think that goes back to the mileage where if influence, provision, protection, your will, those are things that demonstrate a little bit of what a king does within Mm -hmm. a realm of influence within his kingdom, then we all know that as a culture, there are those who are entrusted with things really early, maybe earlier than they're able to handle that. yeah. Yeah. You know, to be given millions of dollars because of a contract or because of an appointment or because of a position. Oh, yeah. and or winning the lottery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or leaving college a year early because you can throw a football. I mean, or your, we know your, a number of those your, guys. Your little, tech, well. your little tech company got bought out big right. and mm-hmm. you're 30 years old and you have a lot of money. That doesn't necessarily mean you know how and are ready to handle that. I think that's what we're talking about. There's certain things in the masculine journey that mileage is important. And you can gain the kind of wisdom from experience. And some of those experiences are, like you said earlier, I didn't do that well. And to be a good king, I think before we take a break, one of the things that we're going to suggest, even promote, that a good king, small K king, knows who the king of kings is. That's just a critical. That's real important. That he is wonderfully subject to and knows that whatever it is that he's entrusted with, to some degree he's earned. There's a biblical principle reality that to whom has been entrusted with a little and been faithful will be entrusted to more. There's just this idea that what you are entrusted with can grow. There was three servants. One of them went and buried the talents, and the other two invested them. And the master was pretty upset with the one who didn't trust him and who lived fearfully. So Mm -hmm. there's really some dynamics that we want to unpack some more, talk some more about, about what it is to be a good king. But this is a good place to take a break, and we'll jump back in on the masculine journey conversation, the king stage. We'll be right back. Marriage may be the most sacred of all human relationships. Two people coming together as one. There may not be anything more powerful than two people walking with God together. It's kind of mind-boggling, actually. And because of the power and weight of marriage in the kingdom, it should not come as any surprise that marriage is violently opposed. It's a favorite target of the enemy. We believe this is why you don't have to look very far to find a marriage that is in trouble. Assaults on marriage and challenges to marriage are everywhere. 
But we at Zoe know there is a way for couples to make a comeback. Learn how to fight back, enjoy being restored, and actually thrive in the midst of day-to-day battles of life. Marriage is worth fighting for, and having the right weapons and tools, training and orientation is crucial. That's why we created The Rendezvous Project, a 12-session video series recorded live during one of our recent Rendezvous Weekend Marriage Conferences. Through The Rendezvous Project, we hope to empower marriages to either take a weekend away together and host your own marriage retreat, or journey together in a weekly small group, discovering your true heart, the deep and beautiful heart of your marriage, the context of the larger story your marriage is in, and how to walk intimately with God together. For more information about The Rendezvous Project and to stay up to date with the latest news leading up to its release, visit therendezvousproject.com. Welcome back to the Exploring More podcast, and we're talking about the masculine journey. Part three in our series is the King Stage, SJ and Tom and I exploring more about the significance, the weightiness of this stage. We talked about the sage and this time of influence, but I love what Gary even talked to us about, SJ, in that podcast. It's a time where his influence changes. He's no longer reigning and ruling over something larger. Maybe he's given the company to his sons or to a successor, but he's an elder. Mm -hmm. A sage still has a voice. He still has many years of influence and many years of lessons and wisdom and and training learned. And a good sage needs a good king. A good king needs a good sage. You want to have some sages like we have come to know and appreciate Gary Barkalo. Not all of our sages are alive. Tozier and Lewis and mm-hmm. Thomas Keating. We're mm-hmm. just talking about right. him the other mm-hmm. yesterday. And so those are the sage voices, the sage advice, the sage direction that we have gleaned and enjoyed. But every king needs to have sages and sages need kings in which they're not in charge of the kingdom, but they mm-hmm. can influence the king. I mean, how powerful yeah. is that idea? And then good kings need warriors that come under their leadership, oh, their sure. training, yep. their influence. Yeah, as a king, right, most of the time, you're not out on the battlefield anymore. It's like when Winters made yeah. major and yeah. he wanted to go take the town, yeah. and his superior says, get back here, we need you back here. So He's talking about Band of Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Band of Brothers, that's right. That's yeah. a great example of lieutenants are out there on the field, mm-hmm. you know, sergeants are out there on the field, mm-hmm. you know, and all the other enlisted men, yeah. but you graduate to a place where maybe the most strategic position for you to be is seeing the field. That's right. Coaches don't play anymore. Right. That's But a a lot of coaches who played make for really great strategy and leaders and father. I like that too. You know, we're seeing this in in a Mm. lot of professional sports. These guys who are coaches, when their players talk about them, they're talking about the way they father. Mm -hmm. Let's bring a little more definition to King. What do we mean by that? I almost would say that it's the culmination of all the other stages prior that have given you experience, have given you insight, have given you the ability to look and see the field, what's happening here, what's going on. Well, that doesn't come any other way but by experience or revelation from God. And that's the other thing is as we grow as a man, if it's going well, we are becoming more and more dependent on God's wisdom and God's encouragement, and God's comforting, you know, because a lot of times there's nobody else to go to. You can't bring your sorrows to people that you're leading. That's generally not the way it works. It's more, you go go to your peers, you go to other people that are in the same position or level because they can take it, they can hear it. It's not going to cause them to be discouraged or cause them to lose faith in you when you're struggling with something. And it doesn't mean you don't share your weaknesses with other men that you're leading. But I think it does speak to the fact that a king is the expression of, for example, if you didn't learn how to fight well in the warrior stage Well, there's always going to be conflicts. And if you enter into a conflict avoidance mode, you can't be a good king. And that doesn't mean that you're out there in battle with everyone, but it means you can take it, you can handle it, you can stand in the middle of that and not give in. Because if some of the decisions you're making are affecting more than just you, and that's why it's even more important not to cave I, I love when pressure that. comes. I, I know it's true. I've been in these training modules of a king mm-hmm. where 
my popularity is far and my likability is far less important than what's right and what's good in certain situations. So to, even though that's hard, it's I so mean, hard at times. Because we all want to be liked, yeah. right? You know, yeah. we want to be the popular king. And the other thing I love about that that I say amen to Tom is the culmination. One of the things I want to get back to just for a minute, let's get 30,000 feet, is the whole masculine journey mm-hmm. and how these stages affect the next stage. So if boyhood is arrested and then undealt with or unhealed or not untangled, then the king is susceptible there to being liked. If a boy's heart isn't settled and he takes that into warrior, a ranger, you know what I'm saying? So I I, I'm trying to articulate the very same thing that you were saying, but I'm not doing as good a job of it. But the, I, I want to say amen to, if you're wounded in your masculine journey, the enemy will want to use that when you have more at stake. Oh yeah. More people. You do more collateral damage. More collateral damage. Yeah. When a king falls, it is absolutely horrible to a people, mm-hmm. a family, a congregation, a company. It reverberates through and many we, more lives, not to minimize the pain, right, yeah. of the previous stages yeah. when that happens, but you're right, it does. It's like an earthquake. Honestly, we see this with Israel and Judah. We see the kings, first and second kings, mm-hmm. and what happens when a king compromises. That brings me to what I was going to say about, I wanted to add to the definition that a king knows that his life is for others. That to me is one significant way to describe mm-hmm. a king, that he's trying to provide an environment for others to grow. His kingdom is for others. That is a very sacrificial space to be in. Yeah. I've got a quick story about that. The first time I remember doing that, if we've got a minute for it, Michael. So my son was probably 14 or 15 years old, and he's okay with me sharing this story. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sharing it. But he was 14, 15, and we lived in an area of North Carolina where we had a good chunk of land behind us. And he would go back into that land like boys would, right, and explore around and chop down trees if he had something with a blade on it. I mean, do whatever he could, right, to just be a boy. So they were back there and he said, Dad, is it okay if we have a little campfire back there? And I said, well, you know the campfire rules, you know, clean up the site and put the ring of rocks around it and be safe. And I'm fine with that, you know, because it wasn't the first time that he had built a little fire and I'd shown him how to do it and all that. So he goes out there and it's not long after that, I went to work in my office in the house and I went out to the kitchen to make a cup of coffee or something. I look out the back and there was way too much smoke coming from where I know he is. And I got to say, SJ's a former fireman. Yeah, right. So I was a firefighter you, for a long you time. Were, yeah. <laughs> you, so I know something's something up. Something had to raise in, yeah. your, in your mind that probably wouldn't have raised in sure. mine. Like, well, wait he, a minute. <laughs> so he had just gotten a cell phone. So I pick up my phone and I call him and I say, hey, buddy, how's it going out there? You know, and he's all out of breath. Oh, man, uh, we're kind of having a problem with the fire. I said, really? Have you called the fire department? And he said, no. I said, well, hang up with me, call 911, tell them where you are and tell them that you got a brush fire going on because that's what you got. So we hang up and I go into the shed and I pick up a shovel and a rake and I go heading out there and we get the fire under control enough for, it's not going to spread any further until the fire department comes. Fire department comes and douses it. And now here rolls up the forest ranger, <laughs> you know, the dark green truck and, yeah. you know, he's got a badge. So Steven's looking over there and sees him come rolling up and has this kind of look in his eye, like, am I going to jail right now? What's about to happen? I said, come on, buddy, let's go talk to the ranger. So we went over there and explained kind of what had happened a little bit. And he went back to, I sent Stephen back to kind of finish cleaning up. And I said to the ranger, hey, look, man, if you got to give a summons or citation or whatever, put it in my name. Because my son is 15 and he wants to go into the Navy. And I don't know that something like this would ever end up on his record, but I don't want to take any chances. So just give me the citation if you got to give one. So I go walking back over to Stephen and turns out he didn't decide to give a citation that day. But I remember that day as being, you know, I didn't do this because I wanted to earn anybody's admiration or respect or love even. I just want to protect my son. I want to protect my subject as a king who's in a developmental stage of his life. And I don't want this to show up later for him. What I heard is I'm responsible for this. I gave him permission. And that too. And so really, if you pass the buck, it really does stop here. I think that's really good king stuff. Mm -hmm. It stops with you. I think the good kings that I recognize in moments of interviews or within my friendships with you men, 
a good king, another definition idea would be they're really not as concerned about who gets credit. Yeah, that's true. And they are concerned about who gets blamed. Mm -hmm. I like that. And I think that's part of ruling wisely. I'm part of Zoe and part of something, but I also get the quarterback and I'm the general. I'm yeah. I'm the guy who you get the extra who, tenth yeah, of one percent of a vote, extra tenth right? of one percent <laughs> in this uh, cockeyed democracy, whatever that it we might call be. Zoe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, I can feel this whole idea of actually wanting to see younger hearts grow, others get credit, and every now and then there'll be. Like even with my wife and my daughter, they're writing a women's version really of The Heart of a Warrior and hearing the dynamic of that. And I feel the compulsion from time to time to kind of get in there and get heard versus giving way to some wisdom and just waiting to be asked, letting them work this out, work on this. I think that's another quality of a king. You don't offer your opinion because you can. Now you do need to offer it when you're supposed to. But you're trying to create an environment to foster others learning and growing. Yeah. And you're in charge of the safety net yeah. and you're doing your best to bust yeah. the ceiling. I would say I've watched you, Michael, do that over and over and over again with men at all levels of their journey, whether they're absolutely face down in the ditch or whether they're wanting more understanding of taking their walk with God to the next level and out of performance, space living, that kind of thing. But the way you have helped men find a role, find a place on the wall to be part of a team, I've seen it over and over and over again, and it makes men come alive. I've seen it countless times. And I just wanted to tell you that I've noticed that, and it's something that you do naturally, and maybe there is a strategy there, but I think it's a very natural way that you have of understanding what it takes to take a man or a boy or a young man from one place in their life to another. And a lot of times it's that validation that you yeah, do matter. Calling up. I see you. Yeah. And hey, why don't you come be with us? This office environment is like, yeah. it's a perfect yeah. example. Yep. No doubt. And I would say to Michael, in that vein of what you described, I echo everything that Tom just said in affirmation. You've done, that's one of the things. I think that's that I what kings do. You. Absolutely. That's a big part of it. Absolutely. And as you were describing the king being less concerned about himself getting credit, but being okay with taking the blame, the way that landed on me was those are not only kingly qualities, those are sagely qualities too. Yeah, so yeah. each of these stages is linked in both directions. So the king is linked to the lover and the warrior. Yeah. There's aspects that you learn as you are moving towards becoming a king yeah. that help you be a good king. And then as you're a king, you're learning how to be a sage. And all the while, this is happening in a fallen place with others who are on their journey and may not be where you are. So I want to transition a little bit. And thank you for saying that. Yeah. And I want that. I see that in you men. I see how you do that to other men. So I love that we get to do that together. And what you were talking about, in that encouragement, Tom, of what I do, what God's been growing me up to offer. There was a time not too long ago where that very quality was compromised to some degree. And what I'm talking about is wounded. You talked about the connectedness yeah. of all the Coming other... Coming from the wrong motive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. And yeah. there's such subtleties in this there for are. kings. Mm -hmm. And so the other stages matter. They give way up the ladder or along the linear mile markers and how that particularly looked for me was when the wounds were more untreated, I could encourage a man, but I needed something back from him. I needed an acknowledgement. I needed a thank you. I needed a recognition. And that'll get a king in big trouble. And so mm -hmm. those were stages back more so in warrior. I got to work through that and walk with God in that. But he kindly showed me that if I'm going to attach these strings to this, then the gift is not going to be done well, and he may not continue to entrust it to me because it would be damaging to me. Right. The kindness of, of the mm -hmm. Father is, if I keep letting you do that, then you're actually going to not only be hurting others in the ways that you're going to be manipulating them, oh, yeah. but you're going to be, your reputation, our relationship, it's not going to be good for what I have for you. So 
to see some things like that, some healing take place in our lives and in our journey. My point is that you are absolutely right, that things that are unhealed, untreated, will come out and can come out in the king stage. So there is still healing available. It's not like you've arrived in the king stage is what I'm saying. There are things that can be somewhat even exasperated in that space and by those who are under your influence and under mm-hmm. your encouragement. Before we leave the stage and step away from this one altogether, can we talk about that woundedness? What does woundedness look like for a king? When are these deficits, maybe these uninitiated, unvalidated spaces, how do they get exaggerated in a king's yeah. stage? And, and just in a sense of overview, Michael, what has occurred to me during our time together is that whatever stage you're in, if you've got woundedness or vows or agreements that you've made that are undealt with, you're just going to carry them into the next stage. Like you referred to earlier, Michael, you said about, you know, something happens to a boy and he makes an agreement, I'll never be whatever, or I'll always be whatever it is. If he doesn't work through that, he's taking it with him all the way into the king stage and sometimes to the sage stage as well. And as your influence grows, as you progress from each stage, the stakes get higher and higher. And I think what we've experienced in the context of our the Heart of Warrior Encounter weekend and the advance, like you were talking about, Michael, earlier, these guys that are showing up, they're 40, some of them younger sometimes, but usually somewhere around 40 to 60 years old. And I think they are wanting to work out and wanting to deal with the compounded interest of their woundedness mm-hmm. through their life, because many of them are in a place where their kingdom is falling apart. Yeah. When I look at the scale of how the two realms and two kingdoms work and what the enemy is up to, stealing, killing, destroying, I think one of the things we mentioned earlier that the king stage is compounded. If the influence of a good king is so good for others under him and with him, then the contrast is true. Even a good king who has a bad day, the influence of that, the effect of that can ripple and can be very, very hard or hurtful harmful even. And as a good king, you recognize those bad plays, those bad moments, those bad decisions, and you don't live with them going unsettled, untreated. That I think is a quality of a good king too. When he makes his mistakes, he's there to not explain necessarily, but apologize and to to care for that heart that he's hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, No excuses. Right. right? I'm just here to say I'm sorry. Hopefully by that season of life, we have eyes to see See. our stuff, our our mistakes, or our distractedness about something else when we were dealing with someone's heart and weren't present or weren't even listening or got angry with them or were short-tempered or irritable when it really wasn't about them. And those are the things that at this stage in my life, I pick up on much more, more quickly yeah, than, I, than I would have before. Right. And it's we talk about part it. of it. You get eyes, your eyes yeah. get a little bit more sensitive to things that you don't want to bring to the world. You, yeah. don't, you, you know, you want to deal with that either with your friends or with God, but the healing part absolutely continues. I think it maybe gets accelerated actually. Yeah, I agree with you there. Talk more about that. Why do you think that is, that it accelerates? Well, because you're in more situations that have the ability to call up stuff in us that we can see. You're in situations that are maybe a little bit more intense or more high stakes involved. Yeah. So if there's fear in there or if there's timidness or lack of resolve or uncertainty, it'll probably show itself in that season of our life more than ever. And think about if the influence has grown those that you are influencing grows. That's the good part. Mm. But the people who aren't maybe going to understand why you're doing what you're doing, the critics Mm. that can be even really nearby within your influence, within your leadership, within your company, within your family, there's those who can be offended by the decisions you're making and talk about them, not with you, Mm. you know, but they're airing it out with other you mm-hmm. called them subjects. Uh, we got to find a better word <laughs> well, for that. No. <laughs> for other, uh... In the parlance of being a king, right? Yeah, I mean, but, they're, but your, are... they're your charges. Yeah. They're who you've been given and responsibility There's for. Responsibility is a big yeah. part of this. I think another thing that, you know, a king will struggle if he's still struggling with his own diminishment and some of the things of his past, if a king feels disqualified, if that's what the enemy's whispering to him, 
that's going to be really hard to love others well mm-hmm. when you feel disqualified. And love others well, we mean there's some fierce things that need to be talked about. A good king is going to have some conversations. I don't know how regular they have to be, but at times they're going to have conversations of, can we talk about something? Can I share with you something that I see? And I love you. I love you. That's why I want to talk about Mm -hmm. this. Help me understand this. I've got some questions. We're not talking about dictatorship. I mean, that's not the point. The point is how you preside over the hearts of others that have been entrusted to you, knowing that they're not where you're at. I don't want to assume that everybody's behind me because there's so many people in my life that have things that I need to learn from them. And I think that's a posture of a good king. But then when all the information's in, the counsel of the Lord is the most important thing that a king has, that he knows how to walk with God. And he knows that there are things that God wants to continue to reveal to him, to show him, invite him into, I believe, so that he can even entrust him more. I'm not talking about prosperity. Now, I'm not talking about productivity, but I'm talking about the precious things of the kingdom that when you're ready, right? When you're ready, Neo, you won't have to. When you're ready, I'm going to give you the desire and the vision. This is probably a Barcolo quote probably. Right, from Philippians that it's his will to give you the desire, right? Right. He wants to give you the desire for something that then he's going to bring into your life. Mm-hmm. And that can be a hard assignment. Sure. As you're talking about your kingdom growing or potentially shrinking, you know, we think about our physical kingdom. You know, as we started this podcast, we were talking about, Tom, your business and the ministry and our own lives. And I think it's way more important, and I'll just say it that way, it is more important to consider the borders of your spiritual kingdom. Amen. Your kingdom in the spiritual realm. Um, And understand that your borders are going to move. They're going to expand. They're going to contract right? They're going to grow. They're going to shrink. And that's okay. There's something going on there. God is up to something in the growth or the retraction of your borders in the spiritual realm. Well, if you think about the many agricultural references, there's seasons of pruning, right? right? There's winter dormancy. There's just things that are going to happen in your kingdom. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want you to misinterpret pruning Mm -hmm. as punishment. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to take some things away because I really want to entrust you. I want to know that you can trust me. It's a variety of things. Well, to even a, to begin to yeah. explain the mystery of it is, <laughs> I know it is so wild. That is something that's true to this time of life, though. And I don't think it's unique necessarily to the king stage, but it's unique in the way that it lands on you in the king stage. When God is taking things away from you, the way I've experienced that is that so I can focus on what he really wants me to pay attention to, so that I'm not distracted by those other things that might have been good things. Right. And but so they're that, not the best. So thing. at that stage, right. if you misunderstand the heart of God yeah. in the king stage, it can go very badly. Right. You'll keep you pressing bitter, in and yeah. pushing in and bitter and frustrated when there's other questions and other ways to ask them. Mm-hmm. Why can sound like a why me, why me? But there's a prayer in there. Why me, God? Why now? What are you up to? What and I think a king has learned, has learned to walk with God in that mm-hmm. way. Closing this out, I think there's some great illustrations. And the one that I'll wrap up with is love Robert to Bruce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, love the illustration, love the character. And the story's about Wallace, right? Mm -hmm. But who's the king of Scotland? To see Wallace a warrior, yes, Wallace has influence. Wallace has a reign and a rule, a responsibility. He is going against the evil that his countrymen are under. And he's calling Robert to Bruce up and calling him in. It's really king to king, but for the reality of that story, what the position Wallace is in, and there's another voice that's in Robert the Bruce's ear, right? Mm-hmm. And Yeah, his father. And it's not a good one. No. It leads him to compromise, but over the storyline, it leads him to conviction. I'll never be on the wrong side again. And a king has stories like that. A good king has stories of compromise and stories of recovery and stories of restoration, and stories of conviction. And so wherever you are, listener, in your story, maybe you're in your 30s and this stage is not yet yours. Doesn't mean you don't have responsibilities and opportunities to love people well. But if you are in your 20s and 30s, I hope, we hope that you can find a good king. Some of us have found bad kings and they have shown us ways we don't want to love And that's an important and lesson. People. And everybody should have a few of those. Yeah. Robert the Bruce had his biological father. I know father, how I right? don't want to do it. Right. I yeah. know how I'm not going to be. Mm-hmm. And then there's the kings, the sages, 
that, like I said earlier, the hope of having wisdom imparted to have young hearts, grandchildren, sometimes children, adult children. We're in that mode as Mm -hmm. kings. Kings have adult children mostly, and to love them in that stage, to know that my role's not over as a father. It's different. I'm not wiping and picking up, you know, so much anymore, but how am I loving them as a good king, as their dad? I think that was so important. You brought that up earlier. So I could go on and on. This is a stage that I think is absolutely amazing, critical. I think it's where the enemy gets his two and three and four for ones. If he can take a king out, he gets a kingdom. If the king will compromise, all those under that influence will be affected, uh, impacted. So it's a critical, critical stage. You know, next podcast, we're talking about lover and Tom will be back with us talking about the lover stage yeah. Yeah. because he is the doctor of loveology. <laughs> he is that. And uh, he... Uh, I love wearing he, that moniker. Hey, yeah, that's, a nice, <laughs> yeah. that's a nice badge. That's a nice... Heck yeah. We'll have to find a diploma place, template that's somewhere right. and, and get him an honorary doctorate of love. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to step into the love lover stage next. And, yeah. Uh, okay. But thank you for spending some time with us yeah. in the masculine journey, talking about the king. We did not exhaust it, but I think we, no. we did touch no. the tip and, mm-hmm. and that's well, a good thing. I know we're landing on the plane, but it just had a, this question popped into my mind for the listeners. What would be a great resource? Michael, recommend a resource for someone on this topic, this stage of life, or just the stages of masculinity in general. And Tom, if you might be able to come up with one too, a resource these guys could go to. Yeah, two that come to mind. Gordon Dalby's book, Healing the Masculine Soul, it talks about these stages. It's one of the places that we got oriented to this. Mm -hmm. John Eldridge wrote a book called Fathered by God, Mm -hmm. very much about these stages that we've adopted and believe as well. We talk about these at our conferences, and I would say directly our email. If you want to talk about this, if you want to explore this, if you want to dialogue about this, if you want healing because you're in this stage and not sure how to recover from what's happened to you, then I would say our weekends. Part of a Warrior talks about the King of Kings and getting him right. If we're going to get right, we have to get him right. So those yeah. are some resources, I think, uh, yeah. off the top of my head to, to shame, dive into. Yeah, man. Shameless plug for the Heart of Warrior Encounter weekend, I got to tell you, because I went just as a participant for several times that I went, and it really helped me to work out some things in the previous stages in my life, all the way back to boyhood, so that I could be a better king. king yeah, you know, and, me too. and I'm still working that out. Me um, too. Tom, you got anything you want to recommend? No, I would just ditto the John Eldridge, Fathered by God. It, yeah. It goes through this each one of these stages in really good detail with a lot of illustrations and stories. So that would probably be at the top of the list I'd recommend. Great. Well, listeners, if you do have any questions for us, we want to encourage you to email us exploringmore at zoe, Z-O-W-E-H dot O-R-G. Check us out on the web, zoe.org. You can find out more about the podcast at zoe.org forward slash podcast. You can find information on our website, zoe.org, Z-O-W-E-H.org forward slash events. We hope to see you there and we'll see you next week. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Exploring More. The landing page for this podcast is zoe.org forward slash podcast. That's Z-O-W-E-H dot org forward slash podcast, where you can find the show notes and various platforms to which we broadcast. You can also find us and the life of more by visiting Zoe on the YouVersion Bible app, Right Now Media, our Facebook page, and Zoe on Instagram and Twitter. Remember, with God there is always more, and you were made for more. Mm-hmm.